The rain in the background right now is an audio file that has been on my hard drive for over 20 years. I mean, not in exactly the same hard drive, but I've been making copies of it and taking it with me for uh, the last two decades. And I've fallen asleep to it. I mean, I used to fall asleep to it before I got a noisemaker. I figured it would fit the tone of this video, which is supposed to be like a relaxing journey through the entirety of the creation of the Enormandala, my reasons for making it, what it might represent, what I will use it for, and what it has meant in my life as I have slowly, slowly worked to complete it. A year and change ago, I stumbled upon a channel called Peter Draws. In his videos, Peter would do just that, but his subject matter wasn't the highly focused illustrations and figure paintings that's commonplace on YouTube. Peter would draw with an astonishing level of skill and style the way one might idly draw on a scrap of paper while having a conversation on the phone. I've doodled like that endlessly throughout my life while getting through classes or conversations for two very distinct reasons. One, my hands always seem to need something to do. I'll fidget and touch everything and drive my wife insane while playing with a gadget when all there is to do is talk. My hands have a mind of their own that are going to go reach for something and they need to play with something. There is no stopping them, at least not for long. And reason number two, my f brain finds focusing on what's taking shape on a piece of paper infinitely easier than focusing on someone's face. It never occurred to me that you could specialize into doodling, refine it into just stunning art pieces that don't really depict uh, anything in particular, just pleasant shapes that suggest something, an urban landscape, a flock of birds, billowing smokestacks, some weird organic growth, stuff like that. Peter Dross would do it all with magnificent ease. It's astonishing. One such of his videos, I didn't check whether it was the most popular, but it has millions of views by now. It's a time-lapse of a giant mandala he drew by hand. I was mesmerized watching this thing. Not just the final result, but, you know, the, the process of creating it. In his narration, he says he worked about an hour a day for a month, listening to music albums and audiobooks, and it seemed like such a pleasant experience. His material kept making me want to doodle things all the time, but it was that video that really gave me the final push. It made me wonder, if you go digital instead, how far can you take this idea? You know, if you take advantage of all the, all the, the symmetry tools and multi-brushes in digital painting, how much bigger can you go in a comparable time? Like, okay, don't pretend to have Peter's talent, so it's going to be a lot slower and uh, not as nice looking. But I became irresistibly curious to see what the final result would be. And so I embarked on this project you are seeing right now. Finished at last, a year and change after I started it. I knew back then it would take a very long time to finish it, but I didn't imagine it would take this long. And that's the way it goes every time, really. I'm currently writing my third novel, so you can be certain I'm no stranger to long projects of dubious worth and even more unlikely monetary gain. With a finish line so distant, I have no idea where it's at, let alone when I'll reach it. In fact, in order to keep going toward that blurry mirage of a finish line, you often have to pave the road ahead with delusions. It won't take me more than a year, I'll tell myself, despite all evidence to the contrary. It's only a few chapters after this, I'll tell myself. Nowhere near an actual proper ending. A classic is when my birthday rolls around. Without fail, I'll tell myself, mm, this novel will be done and out the door before the next birthday. Yep, yep. Yeah, I mean, sure, I did fulfill that promise twice already. Of the ten times I've made it to myself. So there's still hope, I guess. Of course, you know, I'm not saying that I've been working non-stop for a full year on this thing. This video is about 65 hours of recorded drawing. I think you can round it up 
to about 70 if you count the time spent before and after each session, just staring at it and, and just figuring out what to do next. So if I kept to the one hour a day schedule, I would have been done in a bit over two months. Unfortunately, mostly due to the stupidly demanding post office day job, this year I haven't had even one hour to spare every single day. And when I do, there can be four or five other things I should be doing with the time. I was pretty good about it until Spelunky 2 came out and I made a ton of videos about Spelunky 2, devoted all of my free time, my free YouTube time to build Spelunky 2 content and I basically ran out of free time to do the Enormandala project until much later. I also don't have a lot of endurance as an artist. Uh, two hours in a row is just as much as I can focus without getting fed up. So when I do get the time on my days off, I'm really unable to stick with it for a very long time. I think the most I worked in a single day was three hours in a particularly productive Sunday. It was at the very end. You know, when you get close to the finish line at the very end, you want to do a big final sprint toward it because you can see it all taking shape in front of you and you're like, oh yeah, oh yeah, just a little bit longer. So, you, you know, you spend five hours working nonstop just to get that done. Often resulting in a little bit of burnout, but it's totally worth it. And like I said, it's very rare for me to focus on something so intensely. The lack of focus is a problem with pretty much anything I try to accomplish. I think only video games are capable of holding my undivided attention for more than an hour at a time. Fortunately for my writing efforts, I seem to be able to get into it just about anywhere at a moment's notice. So as long as I keep my laptop handy, it kind of works out. This very loose script that you're listening to right now was written 10 minutes at a time between bouts of mail delivery. Anyway, I told you why I got started, but if you're anything like my wife, you might be wondering why this? Of all the long-term projects you could have spent your time doing, why this? Are you sure you're not autistic? Yeah, that's a, that's a direct quote from my wife. She's a, she's a real peach. Don't get me wrong, she's a big fan, but, you know, she's my wife. It's in her job description to make fun of me all the time. Well, to answer her question, I'm not diagnosable. I know that much. But between this and the social woes you may have heard me talk about in the past, you know, the, the social anxiety and the difficulty in maintaining eye contact, like I have a... I have to consciously concentrate on maintaining eye contact. Otherwise, I'll just look down, I'll fidget with something in my hands, I will not look at people. And that's something that I have to self-correct. And I think the difference between me and going over that threshold is that I can actually notice that and correct it consciously, but it definitely does not come naturally, you know. So, yeah... I probably have a, a touch of the tism. Of all the things that I've done, this type of drawing is by far my favorite. Just these intricate repeating shapes and the symmetry and pleasant curves of which you can almost see the mathematical function that carries them. There's something deeply pleasing about shaping these patterns and I really wouldn't mind starting another drawing in the same style. As you watch it take shape, I hope that you can notice the improvement taking place. I noticed such a difference between the first mandala and the last that I, I went back later and spruced it up just a little bit. The difference in style also happened because the goal of the project evolved over time. I started just drawing for its own sake, seeing how big it would go. But I realized at some point in the middle, I could use this in the mythology of that new novel I mentioned. Each mandala could represent the most prominent halls betwixt. Places like Glintem and Evergarden, the bed of maggots, the homes of the Skin Father and the Gorget and Mother of Moth, the Silver Shades and the Life Merchants, all of course connected to Sabbat, the Begotten Core. Well, this is all tentative. Uh, the novel is not so much about the mythology is the journey of a young woman into it and all the things that she does even to reach it it's strange and that's that's something that i have been trying to have it at, at the forefront 
It needs to be weird. It needs to be always, you know, nothing new under the sun and all that, but always trying to come up with original stuff that is not a cliche. It's very, all very much connected to the our real world. That's something that I've always focused on, or I like much more stories that connect to our world as opposed to a completely independent fantasy world that happens to have humans in it. That's something that, while I have enjoyed many, many stories that I love that do that, as someone to create a, a fantasy setting, it always bothers me. It's like a barrier that I cannot get through of this other world somewhere that also has humans somehow. It's like something I just cannot get into. It needs to be connected to our world and there's humans because there's humans on Earth, if you catch what I'm trying to say here. This particular setting, it's like all the offspring of human conception exists in the transept. But it's not like anything you imagine can happen. It's more amalgamations, uh, representations of our both our primal desires and drives, as well as our rational creations and everything in between. It's a, a highly malleable world, and I really enjoy the fact that you can basically make up anything and it will fit somewhere in there. All of it with a very tenebrous slant. Uh, it's, it's a pretty dark novel in the sense of not just the concepts and the, the story that is being told, which is the darkest I've ever gone, admittedly, but also everything has this shadow upon it, like the Eye of Cthulhu watches closely. I definitely wouldn't call it Lovecraftian, but you know, with that sort of tone. I writing complete silence, it, any kind of music, especially with lyrics, is going to intrude into my thoughts and I'll completely lose track of whatever the hell I'm trying to compose. But when I'm drawing, it's a completely different part of my brain that's focusing on a drawing. I can listen to anything at all and I'll be drawing no problem. I, I will, I've had hour-long conversation, you know, every Sunday I have a ritual of calling my parents, we have made it into a thing, I do it every time, we keep in contact, I keep my Spanish fresh that way, it has a multi-purpose conversation, you see, and uh, I have done it a couple of times, just drawing through the whole thing, and it kind of brought back memories and times where I would just lounge uh, at the couch watching TV with my parents and I would have a you know a drawing pad in my hands and I'm drawing and listening to the TV and the conversation with my parents it was kind of a throwback when I did that a couple of times and it's just strange the way that the drawing brain is completely removed from the language brain I can't say I'm going to have like a hundred percent engaged conversation while I'm drawing but I can listen and I will be able to internalize all kinds of information. Much, much like Peter Draws, I put on a bunch of, well, I don't know if he did YouTube videos, but I definitely cleared all my watch later uh, list of all kinds of idiotic nonsense. And once I was done, I was kind of fed up of listening to YouTube rants about the latest game to fail. I uh, turned to audiobooks and I have become quite the fan of audiobooks. I never tried them before. I figured you can't hold a candle to just giving me a book and I hold the book and I read the words on the page. Also, my ability to process information from a spoken perspective, I had never thought that it was as thorough as me being able to read it on the page and being able to go back and reread sentences and especially appreciation for good prose. It's not going to be the same when you're listening to something. And that is true indeed. I do feel like I lose that component of like I am not analytically experiencing a book the way that I would 
if I were just reading it. But listening to audiobooks is awesome. <laughs> it's a it's a great great experience the way that just listening to any story would be and I was surprised that my brain could process it properly. It's it's a great experience. That being said, while I will continue, I think what I'll do and that's what I did because I started listening to the Harry Dresden, the Dresden file books. Listen to audiobooks that I have already read so long in the past that I barely remember anything. And I think it's the best happy medium for me. Uh, when experiencing new stories, I would still would rather just read them. I've also been using e-readers in general, even on the phone while I'm having lunch on the day job. And once again, it was a very pleasant surprise the way that you know you do miss it you miss the physical book in your hand of, of print lettering that kind of medium it will never be topped in, in my perception but it is just as good the problem that i have with it and it's not a problem that's going to stop me from using it you can't bond with an e-reader file I have books that I have read 10 years, 20 years ago that I can look to the side and I see them on my shelf. And that book will, just by existing there, there's a connection. I mean, not to get too sp spiritual or weirdly emotional about a certain piece of uh, printed paper on my shelf, but there's that bond that I can reach and grab it and touch it and even smell it and it will bring back that emotional core that was left in me when I experienced it, that story. That's not gonna happen with a file on my phone, with a file on my e-reader. It's a great experience. I get to read the story and I enjoy it very much, but it doesn't have that extra component of bonding with a physical object that contains all that wondrous, beautiful experience. And that's my tangent on audiobooks. I hope that you enjoyed it. Similarly, with digital painting, there is definitely something lost. I drew on paper and pencil for most of my life, and I, I transferred to digital on all, most of my drawings, with the exception of the Last of the Wicked map. I did that by hand on a on a sheet of A4 paper. What I'm trying to say is that there's there is something lost. Is this giant drawing is just a file on my computer, and somewhat related to that, I only stopped because the file became so unwieldy that uh, it was taking forever to save and load it up and you know you could see the brushes taking a little bit of a of a lag in putting down the ink the the e-ink and i was like all right it's time to ex stop expanding on this thing because i don't want to create several files and then join them i felt like that kind of went against the spirit of the drawing much like if you have a giant sheet of paper you fill up the sheet of paper and you don't then grab more sheets of paper and then tape them together unless that's what you set out to do from the beginning. You, you're not going to do that. So I was like, all right, this file, this is the square I'm going to fill up with, with mandala information and I'm going to finish at this size. And this is as big as I went and that's what you're watching. Finalizing right now, the very end step that you are watching right now definitely took the longest it's a good fifth of the runtime all that background stuff it was a lot of intricate work and look at the symmetry that's being used i'm only drawing three little pockets per row and there's 25 copies being made as i draw the three rows and it it was enormously time consuming that's the beauty of the digital medium that i was hoping to uh, take advantage of and you know that definitely came through the way that symmetry allowed me to create this giant piece of art that i would have taken literally 500 hours 
a thousand hours, probably more, probably more. I bet it would, if I were to do this by hand, each and every one of these lines, it would be no less than a thousand hours of work without using this symmetry with my current talents. But since this is just a file on a screen, I was like, there's no way this is going to remain a file on the screen. I need to print it. I need to make a huge poster. From the beginning, I definitely had the plan of, I will spend all this time making the biggest mandala structure that I can possibly create. And then I'll go to the local printer and uh, I will print it out on as big as it will look nice, you know, because the resolution will only go so far. And uh, I have already done that. I made a couple tests, did a, a two foot by two foot print, and that looks good, but definitely too small. I also made a three foot by three foot, and I think that is by far the optimal size of this print gonna tell you ain't cheap to print of that size i assume it's not just the paper and the ink the ink is expensive as hell but it's not paper and ink but also amortizing is that the word or is it amortizing pretty sure it's amortizing paying for the printing equipment <laughs> that because you know you're not going to print that on a freaking epson 500 that you have on the side of your computer is gonna be a giant machine printed out that uh, piece of art so you know spent a pretty penny to make a nice printout on a frame canvas put it on my living room it looks absolutely gorgeous flattering myself a little bit i think i earned it i i'm very pleased with the result i don't know if it comes through in the narration that i'm doing it looks better than what I anticipated it would look like. It started as a derivative, let's make a mandala, but in my own style kind of thing. And it morphed into this gigantic project that is actually very much inspired through the world building that I have made for the novel that I'm writing. So it will also double as illustrations for the novel I'll, I will be using bits and pieces of this it will be you know I, i'll get mileage out of this piece of art is what i am saying so i'm i'm very happy with it that's the bottom line i am glad that i have spent the time to draw this and that's true for every single long-term project that i do Regardless of the monetary gain it brings me in the end, regardless of the possible success it may have, I don't regret a single one of my long as possibly harebrained projects. Hopefully you enjoyed this video. Hopefully you enjoy the art on display. I'll see you in the next one. Until then, I bid you farewell. <laughs>